God. <clears throat> Every time I hear or read that passage, <clears throat> I'm reminded of a brother out in uh, a brother out in uh, California. He uh, some years ago had a disease, and they had to remove his tongue. And he's he's difficult to understand, but. I've gotten where I can understand him. And uh, he's told me a couple of times that it was the best thing that ever happened to him. He said he stopped talking. He started listening. And uh, he's just so thankful for the gospel, and he's just so gracious. And, and uh, what a blessing. To be forced to listen. Let's look back here at Josh, Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord... Choose, this, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Last week somebody asked me a good question, and they said, what do you say when will worshipers use Joshua 24, 15, to support man's so-called free will or the free will in the way that they use it. You know, will worshipers are called that in Scripture because they worship their will. It's a boasting in man's will to say that a sinner has the final say as to whether God can or cannot save him. That's boasting in man's will. That's worshiping man's will. It's boasting in a man's will to say a sinner either makes Christ and his work effectual for them or he makes it non effectual for them based on whether or not he chooses or rejects Christ according to his will. It's boasting to say a man can decide whenever he will that he will serve the Lord. And this is the verse that's often used to support that. Will worshipers preach so as to put the sinner on the seat of judgment and to put God on trial. <clears throat> but the gospel declares God is the judge. The gospel declares Christ is the advocate. The gospel declares we are the guilty criminal. God's not on trial. If a man's on trial for capital murder, looking at the death penalty, and a judge hands down the verdict of, have you ever heard a judge ask, do you accept the verdict or do you reject it? And if the man's guilty, and it's obvious he's guilty, and yet the verdict was handed down innocent, you ever heard of anybody say, well, I decided I'd accept that verdict. I decided I'd reject that verdict. The gospel comes into the heart of the sinner from the just judge handing down the verdict. That's how the gospel comes. It comes first declaring us guilty, guilty, worthy of the death penalty, guilty. And then it comes as the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ by his substitutionary death in place of his people, settled the justice of God, honored it fully for his people, and redeemed us from all our sins, redeemed us from the curse and condemnation of the law. And when you have that verdict delivered into your heart, it's irresistible. You, you're not going to say, well, I, I'll, I'll mull it over whether or not I'll accept that or reject it. No, you, you'll rejoice. You'll leap. You'll be overjoyed that God has declared that in your heart. 
and the sinner who sees himself as the sinner and beholds Christ his righteousness. He just believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and can't not believe him. He just cannot believe him. You may be surprised at first when you because you see how guilty you are and yet you see what Christ has done and it does seem unbelievable to you at first. But it is a new will given by our Lord and it is it's just irresistible. It's just irresistible. That's when you believe on Christ and you put away the false gods of will worship. You really believe him. You really believe him. I realize that many put this verse up in their home and many have made the statement concerning their house. And it is a very good resolve. It is a very good resolve. It's the resolve that God puts in the heart of every faithful father and mother. There's no doubt about that. But not one of us can bring it to pass. And like a lot of statements we make, when... Will worshiping folks began to make their boast of how, as for me and my house, we are served the Lord. Do you know how heart-wrenching that is to the mother and father, the faithful mother and father, whose heart it is to want to see their children believe the gospel, and yet they don't. And it's not always the father and the mother. Sometimes it's the children who believe the gospel, and they just their hearts break that their mother or their father don't believe Christ. Truth is, as long as a sinner has choices, as long as a sinner has choices, and it's all up to his, him making the choice, his choices are only between false gods, which false god he'll serve. Read this again. Look at verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the false gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the false gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. See, there's the choices. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The choices are between false gods. And a sinner, as long as he has choices, it's only between false gods, which false god he'll choose. When we read a passage of Scripture, you always want to find out who is speaking. Who's speaking? Let's go up to where the quotation begins and let's see who is speaking. Who is speaking? Verse 1, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and he called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Joshua is the preacher, but Joshua's not speaking his word. He's not preaching his word. Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. This is the pre-incarnate Savior to whom God committed the care of his whole house unto from the foundation of the world. And he is speaking serving the Father, and he's speaking through Joshua as he does this day through the preaching of the gospel. And this is the Lord God speaking, and he's the only one who can dogmatically, without any reservation, make this statement. This quotation stays open all the way down, and I'll show you where it closes. But he's the only one who can dogmatically make this statement and bring it to pass without fail and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Lord Jesus can make that statement. He's the head of the house. He's the head of the whole house. God the Father entrusted the whole house to him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father by me. 
Christ is the head of his house. He is the head of his house. He makes his people willing in the day of his power, and he does it to the preaching of the gospel delivered by a man just like Joshua, but Christ alone is the one who works it in the heart of his people. Now, the Lord gives us some examples. He gives us some examples. This is the Lord God speaking. Listen to what he says, verse 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, God speaking, the God of his Israel, the God of the elect, the spiritual Israel, and he says, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, the other side of the rivers that the Lord had brought them across, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Abraham was an unregenerate idolater just like his earthly father. But God the Father had chosen him before the world was made, chose him in Christ, entrusted him to Christ to save him. And therefore God the Father sent Christ, the pre-incarnate Lord of glory, to, to Abraham, and he called him out of idolatry, and he called him out effectually, and he called him out. He said, I took, verse 3, and I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. Joshua can't be speaking. He wasn't even alive. He wasn't even alive. The Lord took Abraham and he passed by his father. Grace is not only effectual. It's not only irresistible when Christ speaks into the heart. It is particular. It is distinguishing. He called out Abraham. And he led him and he protected him. He said, verse 3, I led him throughout all the land of Canaan. And he produced all the fruit in Abraham. He said, and I multiplied his seed and I gave him Isaac. Abraham was a member of Christ's house. He was a member of Christ's house. So Christ, as the head of his house, made Abraham willing to serve the Lord alone. And you say, well, how could the Lord say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? Because God the Father and God the Son are one. They're equal, just like the, the Holy Spirit is one with them. But as the mediator, God trusted the whole work to save the house into his hand. And everything our Lord has been doing since he created this world has been serving the Lord, serving the Lord God. And he brings his people to serve the Lord God through faith in him, just like he did Abraham. And then he gives an example of Isaac and Jacob. He said, I produced Isaac. He was the promised seed. He's the one that the Lord promised Abraham he would produce, who the Lord produced in Sarah's womb after she was past the point of childbearing. When Sarah heard that, she laughed. The Lord said, is anything too hard for the Lord? If you know yourself to be a dead sinner and you see what Christ has done in creating life in you, you know nothing's too hard for the Lord. Isn't that so? And look here, verse 4, And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it, but Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. The Lord made Isaac willing. He, gave, he produced Isaac for Abraham and Sarah, and he made him willing to serve the Lord. And then he gave Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, Jacob and Esau. And while they're in their mother's womb, you know Romans 9, verse 11, the children being not yet born, having done neither good nor evil, that the purpose of God, the purpose of God, according to election might stand, not of works, but of God that calls. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Does that make God unrighteous? Shall we call God unfair because he chose Jacob, not based on any good or evil in him? Have you ever seen Jacob? Have you ever looked at Jacob? His name means supplanter. He came out of his mother's womb, latching onto the heel of his brother. I can understand how God could love Esau. How could God love Jacob? How could God love me? So then it's not of him that willeth. It's not of him that runneth. It's of God that shows mercy. He shall I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I'll pass by whom I will. And that's what our Lord's declaring here. As for me and my house, I've chosen from eternity. I've loved them from everlasting. I sent my son to save them. They shall serve the Lord by his grace. Other members of Christ's house were Moses and Aaron. He said in verse 5, I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out. 
That can't be Joshua talking. Joshua didn't plague Egypt. The Lord did. He appeared to Moses on the backside of the desert in the burning bush. The scripture says the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He said, I am that I am. That's who sent you, Moses. This is the Lord. Now, I won't go through all of this, but you get the point here. It's the Lord who delivers his people. It's the Lord who calls out his people. It's the Lord who makes his people willing to serve him. Over and over through the rest of this rest of this chapter, we see the different things here the Lord worked. He said, he said there, uh, I put darkness, verse 7, I put, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. This is, this is our Lord Jesus, pre-incarnate Lord of salvation, speaking of what God did, and then look what he says. He put darkness between you and the Egyptian. He brought the sea upon them and covered them, and your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. This is the Lord talking of what he and the Father did in saving Israel from Pharaoh and his army. He said there, I brought you into the land of the Amorites. They fought with you. I gave them into your hand. I destroyed them before you. And then when Balak came up against him, he said, I didn't hearken to to Balaam. He tried to use Balaam to curse God's people. Our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to save his children who were under the curse. And he said, he went before the Father, this spotless, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Our Lord of glory went before the Father and said, curse me and let my people go free. And that's what he accomplished. He's never ever, ever going to allow anybody to curse his people. And so he didn't hearken to Balaam. He saved them out of his hand. And you go on down here to verse 12, and you see this is the Lord. I sent the hornet before you and drove out from before you even the two kings of the Amorites, not with your sword and your bow. I've given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you built not. You dwell in them, or the vineyards and olive yards which you planted not do I eat. And when you get down to Joshua 24, 15, it's not Joshua speaking. Oh, he's speaking. He's preaching. This is the word of the Lord. He's declaring what the Lord alone is able to accomplish. By Christ's work, he's driven out all the enemies of his people. It's not been by our sword and our bow. It's not. You think the Lord would declare all of this and then do what Pontius Pilate preachers do? turn Christ over to the will of the people? If it comes down to your will, you know who you're going to glory in? You. Uh, that no flesh should glory in his presence. This is why God saves through the preaching of the gospel. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of God are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto you wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that he that glories let him glory in the Lord it's not by our sword and it's not by our bow he said not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts he's given us a land for which we didn't labor Christ came into this earth and worked all the works to honor and magnify the law of God and he honored it fully and we delight in it in our new man you know why because that law tells me I am the sinner. I'm guilty, but that law, when I look at it and I see what's required and I see something of how holy and just and good God is when I behold his law, I see how holy, just, and good my Savior is and how righteous he is and how thoroughly he saved his people from our sin. He's given us heavenly Canaan. He's given us heavenly Mount Zion. He's given us a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. And we didn't labor for it. We were without Christ and without hope in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made near by the blood of Christ. And he came and he preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were near. For through him, through him, through him, we both, Jew and Gentile, elect Jew and elect Gentile, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And now you're no more strangers and foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints. And you're of what? The household 
of God. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And all his people shall. The Lord Jesus is the head of his house. He alone served God the Father in perfection for his people. And he alone can give a new heart and make his people believe and rest in him. Christ our head is he who's saying, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Christ is the one head over his house who can make this statement, who never fails to bring it to pass. Isaiah spoke the word of the Lord and he said, the Lord said, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he has set judgment in the earth. He settled judgment at the cross and he settles judgment in the heart of his people. He gives you spiritual discernment to behold him and rest in him by faith. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. This is what God said to his son. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast to do of thy youth. He comes and creates a new man in his people, a holy man in his people. It's Christ in you, a hope of glory. And he brings you to believe him and trust him and walk after him and follow him. And he keeps you doing so all your days. We can't bring ourselves to serve the Lord, much less anybody else. We can't. We can't. Now look at the next, down at verse 16. The people answered and they said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. They acknowledged the Lord brought them out of bondage and delivered them there. They, they were there when the Lord brought, brought Israel out. Verse 18, they, at the end, they said, Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said to the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he's an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sin. Now what's he talking about? Well, he says, If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. Not that he's going to ever cast away his people, but he's, they had seen all this good the Lord had done. And if a man can turn from Christ and go his own way and forsake Christ, he never really was called in the first place by the Lord. But Joshua declared to them here their inability and their insufficiency of themselves to serve the Lord. That's what he declared. A sinner can't merely choose God when he will, much less perform service acceptable to the holy God of himself. It's called total depravity. It's called having a sin nature that's still mixed with everything a believer does. Joshua declared that we need the grace of our Lord Jesus. We need to believe on Christ and trust his righteousness. Trust he is the perfect servant of God, the only righteousness by which God will accept us. is Christ. We can't trust in our will. We can't trust in our strength. Those are the false gods that Joshua said, if you turn from this one Lord, that's the false gods you're going after. Our own will. We don't have to make a statue to worship an idol. If we start thinking that our will is of us and we, this new will we have for Christ wasn't given to us, what do you have that you didn't receive of the Lord? Be careful. Be careful. Will worship is, is, is worshiping and glorying in and boasting in one's will. Yes, he makes you willing. You, you're not going to come to God unwilling, but where'd the will come from? He gives you a new will when he creates a new man in you. So our God's perfectly holy, brethren, and we're the sinner. We're the sinner. We need God to accept us. That's what we need. We need God to accept us. It's only in and by Christ, the holy and righteous one. It's only through God-given faith in him. And he, he has to give that to us that we're brought to believe him. And those that forsake Christ alone may not ever even know they've done it. You know, most of them that are speaking here ended up forsaking the Lord. 
Most of Israel forsook him. Most of them did. But when you hear them speak right here, they're saying they knew the Lord. They knew the Lord did all this. How subtle, how subtle unbelief and will worship and trust in ourselves is. And we could be turned to it before we know it. Like we saw this morning when Philip and the other apostles were full of unbelief, the Lord is so merciful and gracious to save us and keep us trusting him and strengthening our faith even though we have so much unbelief in us. That's the good thing about grace. Grace chose you freely. Grace will not let his child go. He will not. Our Lord will keep his people. So Joshua wrote it down, and, he, and as a covenant, he set up a stone. And notice what he said here now, verse 27. No, let, let me go to verse 21 first. The people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, your witness is against yourself that you have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. If, if that's what we're saying, I myself chose the Lord. That's dangerous ground. Joshua said, you can't serve him. If, and, I, and what I think Joshua was saying here is, if God hadn't worked this in your heart and made you willing to believe him, if it's just merely you choosing this day, you know, people get, preachers get up and they start pleading with sinners and pleading with sinners. Listen, I'm, I'm trying to persuade you, like Paul said, but I want God to persuade you. I'm not trying to use enticing words of man's wisdom to try to attract you. I want the Lord, I want your faith to stand in the power and wisdom of God. But preachers get up and beg and beg and beg and beg and beg, and they finally talk sinners into choosing Christ and accepting Christ. Poor little pitiful, feel sorry for the little Jesus, so they accept him. And somebody comes along a little more enticing, and they talk him out of it. But if the Lord works in your heart, and the Lord's the one that called you, and the Lord is one that you're going to choose him, <laughs> you sure are, but it's going to be because he can take all the vain choices away and make you see him as altogether lovely so that you can't do anything else but cast your care on him. And if he's worked it in your heart, he'll keep that in your heart. He'll keep that in your heart. No doubt about it. So Joshua, he wrote this down as a covenant. He set up a stone, and he said, look at verse 27. Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. He includes himself here, doesn't he? The one preaching. He said, For it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. You know, when God preaches preaching, the word he's preaching is the word of the Lord. If he's faithful, if God's given him the man, the word he's preaching is the word of the Lord. And just as Christ is ministering to those before whom he's preaching, Christ is ministering to the preacher too. Joshua said, we've heard the words of the Lord that he spoke to us today. He was the speaker, not Joshua, but he's just the earthen vessel. Just the one used to speak. It's the Lord speaking. And that's what he makes his child know. And he says, and this stone's going to be a witness to you lest you deny your God. Now this is the question I want to ask you. Has God taken away all your vain choices? Has the righteous judge sent the verdict into your heart? If it's so, you know this. You don't have a choice. And here's the thing about that. That's not a bad thing. God's people don't want any other choice. I don't want no... You remember when they were in the storm and... And they went, and Paul said, you got to all stay in this ship. And they went and cut the lifeboats off. Let, them, let her fall. There's no, life, there's no secondary lifeboats. We in, Christ, we in fellowship with Christ, and he's all our hope. He's all our hope. He's finished the work of redeeming us from the curse of the law. He alone served God in perfection, and he made his people perfect in him. Christ gave us life and faith and he's produced faith 
uh, fruit in us. And you know why you're sitting here right now? It's him, him who's kept you to this day, gathered you here, gave me something to preach for you. And he's the one ministering in the midst of his people and keeping us and sustaining us and growing us. I'm telling you, this thing is real. This thing, we got a living Redeemer working actively in his church, ministering to his people. And it is the wisest thing there is that he chose the foolishness of preaching with a bunch of needy, believing sinners to work this. It's, it's the ultimate wisdom that he would do it this way because he makes you learn more and more. You hear his word over and over again. We experience his grace working between us and, and us working, him working grace with your brethren toward you and you toward them. And all of it together makes you know just how truly Christ is our redeemer and working in the midst of his people. Just how truly he is. Our Lord said, except a man born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he spoke of that, that work of the Spirit as being like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. It's irresistible. You can't stop it. And this is how the Lord works when he comes into the heart of his people. And he said himself, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And at the same time, he said, and if I be lifted up, I'll draw all unto me. Are both true? Absolutely. They're one. God the Father and God the Son are one. What the Father's doing, the Son's doing. What the Son's done, the Father's done. And the Spirit. And though our hearts may break, that some in our house don't believe, it's what you can say as David did. Though it be not so with my house, God has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. And this is all my salvation, though we make it not to grow. And you continue to pray. And, and this is what the Lord teaches us, brethren. You continue to pray for your loved ones and those you desire for him to call. But this is what the Lord teaches us. Lord, help us get this. Lord teaches us that, that his house are those he has called to faith in him. That's who his house is. And those are the members of the house of whom we ourselves are members who believe. You're in the house of the Lord. I'm not talking about these four walls. I'm talking about in his house. And your brethren are your brothers and sisters in the house. They're your fathers and mothers in the house. That's so. That's really so. And as for his house, we're all going to serve him. We're all going to serve him. One day, our Lord was uh, preaching, and they came to him, and they interrupted him. They just preached, and they just, somebody came in and interrupted him. And they said to him, they said, your mother and your brethren are outside. They want to speak to you. In Matthew 12, 49, he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples. And he said, behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. And our Lord told us this, when he's called you and made you willing to believe him and serve him, you may have to leave earthly, earthly loved ones. But he said, I'm giving you a hundredfold more right now. Listen, Mark 10, 29, Jesus said, Verily I send you, there's no man that had left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren, sisters and mothers and children, and lands with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. This is what I'm saying to you. I know it hurts. I know it's painful when those we love don't believe the gospel. But here's the consolation. You do, by God's grace. And all those he's called, 
they're your real house. They're your real family. They're your brothers and sisters, your mothers and fathers, your sister in your house. And let me tell you something what the Lord does with his brethren. If y'all seen this video, it's really cute. It, these two brothers, little bitty fellas, and they got on their cowboy boots and they got on their wranglers and their little buckles, you know, and, and they stand by a big old horse. And this horse was a good horse. This horse just stood there. Didn't move, didn't walk, didn't do anything. This, this video is how you, you, you can find it. But anyway, they, and this little, little fella, he goes up to the side of that horse. And he bends over. And he let his brother climb up on his back. And they, that little fella's up on his back. And he still can't reach up to the top of the saddle. And he's pulling and he's struggling and he's trying his best to throw one leg over and the little brother raised up. He starts pushing him then now. He's pushing him on up into the saddle. Finally gets him up there in the saddle. I watched that and it made me it brought tears to my eyes. Because that's what that's what God's people do for one another. He said, carry one another's burden. What's the song? He, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. And when you fall, you just bend over and say, here, get on my back and let me try to help you get back in the saddle. And you push him and try to help him get back in the saddle. That's, that's what Christ did for you and me. And that's what serving the Lord is. Believe in him and loving one another. That's what Christ successfully makes his house do, without a doubt. Remember when that multitude walked away from our Lord? They heard Christ speak, preach to them personally. And when he didn't give them earthly bread, that's all they were seeking, they turned around and walked away. And the Lord turned to his disciples and he said, will you go away also? And they said, Lord, you've taken away all our choices and we don't want another choice. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we're sure you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We're sure. That's what God works in his people. Come what may. He's going to keep his people trusting him. He's going to keep them together in his house, loving one another. Oh, with the grace of God, what a wonderful thing. All right. Adam.